This is the Financial Sense News Hour with the president of PFS Group, Jim Poplava. Since 1982, PFS Group has offered asset management and educational resources that have helped investors build, maintain, and preserve their wealth. Now, here's the Financial Sense News Team, Jim Poplava and John Leffler. It was interesting this week that there was some discussion on the part of the president discussing whether or not uh, Fannie or Freddie could actually, number one, repo houses and then possibly uh, rent them back to the people from whom they had repoed them or to other people. And I, as soon as I heard that, I went, I got it. Uh, we were talking about that something like five or six years ago here on the program, saying we were going to slip back and ultimately people would have their houses uh, leased back to them, but they wouldn't own them anymore. And uh, this was by a problem that the government itself had created, uh, posing itself as the master in that. And, and here you see the, the harbinger of that. But people have also been talking about a lot of the toolkits that uh, maybe the, the Fed has. And some people are saying the Fed's totally out of steam, and therefore they don't have anything else they can do. But I don't think we buy that here. I know you've been talking about financial repression which means keeping interest rates artificially low, and that that would be the... It's a rather complex mechanism. We explained it a couple of weeks ago here on the show. But in keeping the artif- the rates artificially low, it would be an indirect way of creating inflation and injecting more cash into the system. And the Fed said this week, which seems to line up with what you've been predicting, that they were going to try to keep the, the rates very, very low until about 2013. So that would seem to fit into this scenario. Yeah, I mean, I think what they're moving to next, John, is something, it's the second phase of financial repression, something that we did very in a similar way the Fed did in 1951, where they essentially capped interest rates, and that's exactly what Bernanke said uh, until mid-2013. And remember, he said the word at least, so that means it could go beyond 2013. So we are entering into the second phase of financial repression in you know, I, I'm just looking at my Bloomberg screen of interest rates, and I'll just leave it at this. To get a 1% rate of return, you would have to go to a five-year treasury. To get a 2% rate of return, you'd have to go out 10 years. And to get a anything above 3%, you're going to have to go out 30 years. So we're already there. And, I mean, think about it. I mean, if you were investing a million dollars in, let's say, 10-year treasuries today, you would get only 23000 Gosh, I can remember, John, when I got in this business, a million dollars, Treasury notes were at 15%. Of course, that was, you know, in the 1979-1981 period. But you were getting, you know, on a, a million dollars, you would have been, and of course, a million dollars bought you know, a lot more than it does today. You would have got maybe $150,000 in income. Today, you're down to 23000 And it's amazing Mr. Bernanke is basically following his script, and everybody remembers his helicopter speech that he gave back in November 21st, 2002. I dusted that out, got it out of my files, and reread it. You know, he said several things in that uh, speech. He said, first, the Fed should try to preserve a buffer zone for the inflation rate. Look for inflation targeting. He's already hinted at it. Secondly, the Fed should take most seriously its responsibility to ensure financial stability. Well, just take a look at the way the markets are trading, and you think that's stable? Third, as a number of studies have suggested, when inflation is already low and the fundamentals of the economy suddenly deteriorate, the central bank should act more preemptively and more aggressively than usual in cutting interest rates by moving decisively in early the Fed may be able to prevent the economy from slipping into deflation with the special problems that it entails. Now, here's the text that how he tells you he's going to do that, and this was taken from his November speech, and I'm just going to read it here. He goes on. He said, The conclusion that deflation is always reversible under a fiat money system follows from basic economic reasoning. A little parable may prove useful. Today, an ounce of gold sells for $300 more or less. Well, not anymore, Ben. It's closer to 1800 Now suppose that a modern alchemist solves his subject's oldest problem by finding a way to reproduce unlimited amounts of new gold at essentially no cost. Moreover, 
his intervention is widely publicized and scientifically verified, and he announces his intention to begin massive production of gold within days. What would happen to the price of gold, he asks? Presumably, the potentially unlimited supply of cheap gold would cause the market price of gold to plummet. Indeed, if the market for gold is to any degree efficient, the price of gold would collapse immediately after the announcement of the intervention before the alchemists had produced and marketed a single ounce of yellow metal. And this is what we often refer to as, you know, be, when you make the announcement before the deed is done, we call that the open mouth committee. He goes on, what has this got to do with monetary policy? Like gold, the U.S. dollars have a value only to the extent that they are strictly limited in supply. But the U.S. government has a technology called a printing press, or today its electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. By increasing the number of U.S. dollars in circulation, or even by credibly threatening to do so, the U.S. government can also reduce the value of the dollar in terms of goods and services, which is equivalent to raising the price in dollars of those goods and services. We conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate higher spending and hence positive inflation. So there he's given you the blueprint so if you take a look at that speech, and I've done something uh, that uh, I read this a number of years ago, but I think this is a key. I think this was Ben's application or his CV for the job of Fed governor. And it's about an 80-page report that he wrote with Vincent Reithard and Brian Sack, and it's called Monetary Policy Alternatives at Zero Bound, an Empirical Assessment. And I'm rereading it. And in that, Ben outlines his six available tools, what he has in the toolkit. Toolkit number one, increase the money supply. And that refers to what I just read. The U.S. government has this technology called a printing press. Number two, ensure liquidity makes its way into the financial system through a variety of measures. The U.S. government, and I'm taking this from his text, the U.S. government is not going to print money and distribute it willy-nilly, Although, as we see later, there are practical policies that approximate this behavior. Number three, lower interest rates to zero. Under a fiat system, a government should always be able to generate increased nominal spending and inflation, even when short-term nominal interest rates are at zero. Where are we today? At zero. Number four, control the yield on corporate bonds and other privately issued securities. And he goes on. The Fed could offer fixed-term loans to banks at lower zero interest rate with a wide range of private assets, including, among others, corporate bonds, commercial paper, bank loans, mortgages deemed eligible as collateral. Tool number five, we can depreciate the U.S. dollar. A striking example from U.S. history is Franklin Roosevelt's 40% devaluation of the dollar against gold in 1933 and 34. The devaluation had the rapid increase in money supply. It ended U.S. deflation remarkably quickly. I have a a slide that I've shown in client presentations where I show the month, March of 1933, when the Roosevelt administration devalued the dollar by 40%, and immediately by the end of the month, inflation rates were running at 7 8%. So that was tool number five. Tool number six, execute a de facto depreciation by buying foreign currencies on a massive scale. This is exactly what the Swiss bank is doing now. It's intervening in the currency market, buying other currencies, selling Swiss francs to stop the francs rise against other currencies. Finally, tool number seven, buy industries throughout the U.S. economy with newly created money. Well, look, the government basically owns GM, they own Fannie and Freddie. The government, I'm quoting Ben here, the government could increase spending on current goods or services or even acquire existing real or financial assets. If the Treasury issued debt to purchase private assets, and the Fed then purchased an equal amount of Treasury debt with newly created money, basically, John, we're talking about what our listeners are going to hear in the next 
not this weekend, but the following two weeks, what we're talking about here is feudalism, where the state owns your mortgage, they own your house, they own the lands, and they own your industry. And that's what we're going to be speaking about in the next two weeks. But, you know, for people that say the deflationists say that the Fed has run out of bullets, folks, the chamber in Ben's gun is still full, and he's got plenty of ammo. He's increased the money supply. He's made sure that liquidity got into the financial systems. He's lowered interest rates to 0%, and now he can control the yield curve, which is what he just announced he's intending on doing, to the year 2013. So he's only on bullet number four. He just started bullet number four. He's still got bullet number five, six, and seven left in the chamber ready to fire. So that's why I'm going back and I'm reading the paper that he wrote. In fact, I've got like five of his papers. And it kind of reminds me, John, uh, did you ever see Patton, the movie? Yes, the movie Patton, right, with uh, George E. Scott. Yeah, remember that spot in the movie, Patton's taken on Rommel's army. And he's lined up. He knows exactly what Rommel's going to do. And he's got his tank formations in the position. He's, He's laid out a trap for Rommel. And there's this memorable line that he he makes in the movie, and he goes, Rommel, you magnificent bastard, he shouts, I read your book. Because Rommel had published his innovations in the art of war, and Patton, a student of military history, possessed the ultimate advantage. He knew what his opponent's mind was thinking, and as a result, Rommel was defeated before the engagement had begun. And it's amazing, uh, we were uh, several, it was about four or five weekends ago, and a couple of friends and I were getting together. One of them is a tort attorney, and he said, you know, it's very important in tort cases, in your negotiating strategies, the kind of cases you're willing to take on, whether you tend to settle or go to trial. And he was citing Patton uh, studying Rommel's case, and he said the first solution to your problem is to recognize what Rommel apparently didn't. Your opponent really does have a book on your litigation habits. And unless you're just starting out in your legal career. So the claims community has a very efficient information network. He was telling me about in product liability cases, for example, there are typically two insurers involved, the primary insurer and the excess insurer. And between them, the two claims people share everything they know about the plaintiff's console and they supplement that information with calls to their colleagues with other companies. Meanwhile, the defense attorney usually represents many insurance companies, and it isn't too hard to envision how your book gets circulated to eager readers, meaning that when you go to trial, you study how your opposition went to trial. What were their tactics? What things did they use that they become predictable, and then you use that predictability against them? And so I think the same thing in today's market, John, is we live in an age of uncertainty and you've got to change your tactics because the world is changing and you have to understand the minds of the men, whether it's the president or it's the head of the Federal Reserve, what they're thinking and how they're likely to react. And I I can tell you, just going through his papers, he's already told you in his toolkit, these are the tools I have, and he's following his script his book to the mark. He just fired his fourth bullet. He's going to wait for this one to take place. If this doesn't work, he's got three other bullets in the chamber. And so if you're going to battle in the markets, you need to know what the other guy is thinking. And that other guy is Mr. Bernanke. You're listening to the Financial Sense News Hour at financialsense.com. 